this one is like they call it a perfect Q. So, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Toss it, <laughs> dump it in the water. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I wish it would be like us, right? Underwater hiding you. All right. So um, I'll be back there uh, in a little bit. Welcome, folks. I don't know if it's because this is a hot topic, but there are seats available up front. afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much. Come on in, have a seat. Let's get started. So welcome everyone. We'll get started here. I know it's great catching up with people we haven't seen or been with in a long time. Plenty of seats up front if you're looking around. All right, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. I want to start by offering some thank yous and some gratitude if you would um, join me please in, in these. So first, um, let's one more time recognize uh, some of our sponsors our uh, presenting sponsors for the conference are um, Walsh Construction, Wells Fargo, and Oregon Housing and Community Services. Thank you so much for supporting this event. One more round of applause for them, please. I also want to take a moment and um, recognize and say thank you to the staff team of Housing Oregon. Um, Brian Hoop, Stacy Saunders, and then a big, big thank you to uh, Kevin, who, you know, he's primarily responsible for organizing this event. So thank you to the staff and particularly to Kevin. A couple more thank yous. Um, it's great to be in person again in a big 
conference setting, and um, I think we all want to take a minute and say thank you to the amazing staff team that's here uh, supporting us, serving us lunch today, um, all the work that goes on behind the scenes, uh, the AV team, the technology, um, and this, um, this excellent support team. We've been, you've been hustling and planning and keeping us fed, and we just want to say thank you to all of your work for supporting this event as well. Well, let's get into the let's get into the content here. My name is Trell Anderson. I'm the executive director of um, Northwest Housing Alternatives. It's my pleasure to be here in front of you. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors of Housing Oregon. Been serving for the last four years as treasurer. Um, this is a really important topic for us. We're delighted to have this uh, conversation and this panel. Um, let me frame it this way. Uh, and I tend to oversimplify things, I'm sorry. That's why we have technical experts and other opinions here, but it occurs to me that we have a housing crisis in our state where we see more and more people every day becoming homeless in every community. We know that affordability is out of reach for many of our neighbors. But on the other hand, we have this regressive uh, housing tax, which in translation is perhaps it is the largest housing subsidy that the state offers, a huge amount of lost revenue. So on the one hand, we have overwhelming need and demand for housing, and on the other hand, we have lost revenue opportunity. And it's a pretty simple equation to me to connect these and make some fixes. We're gonna get into the details more here over our lunch panel. Um, this past March, the Oregon Secretary of State Office led by Shamia Fagan, uh, the Audits Division released an audit titled, Without Legislative Action, the Mortgage Interest Deduction Will Remain Regressive and Inequitable. As a board member of Housing Oregon, which has been advocating for reform of mortgage interest deduction, we're so appreciative of the Secre Secretary of State's office, uh, their interest in this, um, putting uh, effort and resources behind this audit. And um, I want to thank uh, Kip and John here today for your team's efforts. Um, so today with this is Kip Mehmet who's director of the Audits Division for the Oregon Secretary of State's office, is John Bennett, who is a senior performance auditor, also with the Audits Division. So they'll present kind of the nuts and bolts of the audit, and then we'll have analysis and commentary from Juan Carlos Ordonez, who's communications director of Oregon Center for Public Policy, and Jenny Lee, who is the Deputy Director of the Coalition of Communities of Color. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Kip, and I think we'll just kind of go down the line here. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terrell. Appreciate that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Kip Mamet, I'm the Audit Director for the Secretary of State's Office. I'm here from the government, I'm here to help you. Always gets a laugh, isn't that sad? I'm serious, we're here to help. And I'm really grateful to all of you to spend your lunch hour not typically slotted for audit report discussions. A Little bit out of our element here too, so bear with us that way, but we really appreciate all the work you're all doing to take on this real challenge for Oregon. Um, I wanna tip my hat to Secretary Fagan. She's the third secretary I've had the honor to work for. Um, very aligned with her philosophy and how she's using her audit tool, uh, particularly to look at equity auditing. It's uh, something we've been doing a lot as auditors over the years, but we haven't been calling it that and we haven't been scoping it in a way that actually makes an impact. And so the way we're doing it now is just calling balls and strikes. And I think this, the, the title of this report is calling balls and strikes. We have a major policy in the state that is inequitable and regressive. And we were able through the good work of our audit team, uh, John, I'm gonna turn it over to him, but through our methodology, particularly our data analytics proficiency in our office, we're able to just get away from, 
from um, more broad theoretical discussions and just do uh, number crunching, which auditors are very good at and demonstrate some real problematic elements of this billion dollar subsidy we do every year. So without further ado, I just wanna introduce John, who's gonna run you through a, hopefully won't, won't kill you by PowerPoint. It is an audit. I do encourage you, all our audits are online. Uh, I know they've included one in your packet as well. Uh, we won't be able to do it justice, and so for any of you real nerds who want to get deep in this stuff, it's a fully loaded report with graphics, a lot of different uh, comparisons and trends. So please dig into that, and without further ado, John, take us away and walk us through that audit. Thank you. I will. Uh, thank you, Kip, and, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time at lunch uh, to hear me talk about this. Um, so we introduced the title, so I'll, I'll just skip over to... Um, oh, did it work? There we go. I'll skip over to why we did this audit, and, and, and Kip touched on this a bit, um, and so did Trell, but um, this topic was a priority for Secretary Fagan and was added to, the, to our audit plan using our typical risk assessment process. Um, and then at, uh, from a, a higher level than that, um, the mortgage interest deduction is a significant investment of um, potential state funds, uh, more than a billion dollars. It's the largest housing-related uh, tax expenditure and the eighth largest um, tax expenditure overall. Um, just to sort of set the stage a little bit here, um, I want to define what a tax expenditure is. Um, those are defined in Oregon statute. Um, so a tax expenditure is really any law of the federal government or the state that exempts um, certain persons, income, goods, services, or property uh, from the impact of established taxes. Um, there are roughly, there's nearly 400 of these and the mortgage interest deduction is one. And then just to give just a bit of how the mortgage interest deduction works uh, for anybody who doesn't know, um, if you have a mortgage and have interest that you pay on it, you can deduct that from your taxable income, um, both your federal and your state tax return. Um, but you need to uh, have itemized deductions greater than the standard deduction in, in, in order to benefit from it. So that's just some nuts and bolts on the mortgage interest deduction. Um, go next to our, to our audit objectives. So um, the objective of this audit was to determine the distribution and equity of the mortgage interest deduction in Oregon. And we wanted to look at that by income, by race and ethnicity, and by geography. And then we also wanted to look at the current level of review the mortgage interest deduction is receiving at the state level, um, and who should be accountable for assessing the, its effectiveness. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna jump into some of the numbers we pulled up here. Uh, all right, sorry, I'm gonna stop checking. I know it's coming up now. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, first, I want to just uh, hit on our um, analysis of the, um, the income distribution of the mortgage interest deduction. So um, we were able to get the full taxpayer data set from DOR for the 2018 tax year. It was the most recent year we could. And then we used their measure for um, how much a tax expenditure costs or what the benefit of it is, um, which essentially they model everybody's tax return with and without every tax expenditure and the difference between what they paid and what they would have paid without it is that dollar amount that, that, that gets attached to these. So um, we requested that data from them and we broke it into um, percentiles by income. And um, this first one just really shows how those dollar benefits are distributed within those percentiles. There's a lot of, a lot of numbers on there, but what I really wanna hit home here is um, roughly 60% of the benefit is going to the top 20% of taxpayers, so taxpayers with incomes greater than, than $100,000, um, whereas less than 15% of the benefit is going to taxpayers in the bottom 60% of the income um, ladder, so it's, it's concentrating to the highest income Oregonians. We also looked at it um, by what the average benefits are. We did this a couple of different ways following those same um, income percentiles. So we looked at the average benefit that taxpayers are receiving just regardless of whether they're benefiting from it or not. And you can see a dramatic increase um, uh, in, in, in that one um, from as low as $4 per taxpayer in the lowest 20% um, to over $1,100 for the top 1%. Um, and then another way we did this, we wanted to look to see how much people who were actually benefiting from it are getting. So we kind of cleared the zeros out um, and, and, and did the averages from there. And similarly, there's a dramatic increase um, as you go up in, the, in, the, in, in, in income in those average benefits. Um, what's interesting is kind of regardless of how you look at it, uh, we, we highlighted in the report the taxpayers in that fourth 20%, that sort of working income Oregonian between 57 and $100,000. So their average benefit um, was $311, which is less than a third of the average benefit that was being received by individuals in, in the top 1%. Um, so based on this analysis, the fact that the individuals are more likely to benefit from the mortgage interest deduction as their, 
as their um, income increases and the, the scale of that benefit increasing so dramatically, um, we were comfortable concluding that the mortgage interest deduction is a regressive tax policy because the benefits increase as, the, as, as income goes up. We also um, were able to, to do some distributions by county. There's a lot more work on the county stuff um, in, in the report, but I just wanted to highlight this one area. So we wanted to look to see what the proportionality of the mortgage interest deductions benefits were by county. Um, so we took the percentage of benefits um, going to each county and divided it by the percentage of taxpayers in those counties. So if you were um, basically on this slide, if you're over 100% in that ratio, your county is receiving a greater share of the benefits than their share of the population. And count, there are six counties that fell into that category. They're sort of concentrated around the, um, the metro area with Yamhill County as well, and then, and then Deschutes County. Um, so that was our analysis by geography. Like I said, there's a lot more in the report on that one. Um, so the last way we wanted to look at the mortgage interest deduction was by race and ethnicity. And this was challenging because Oregon, like all other states and like the IRS, doesn't track um, race and ethnicity on tax forms. So there was no direct link that we could get um, to do that. So instead, um, we framed it a couple of different ways. So first, you have to own a home in order to benefit from the mortgage interest deduction. And we were able to get data from the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau to look at the differences in home ownership rates between um, different uh, race and ethnicity groups as tracked by the Census Bureau. Um, and it's pretty clear here, there's a, uh, white Oregonians are significantly more likely to own their homes than most other people of color in Oregon. And some of the differences are dramatic. Um, white Oregonians are more than twice as likely to own their homes as black Oregonians. Um, and there's 20% differences in most of the other um, race and ethnicity subgroups that the Census Bureau tracks. We also wanted to, we were also able to get income data from the American Community Survey. And as we showed before, um, higher income households are more likely to benefit from the mortgage interest deduction. So we, we um, wanted to look at what percentage by race and ethnicity um, of households made more than $100,000. And uh, similar to the last analysis, white Oregonians, in most cases, are significantly more likely to own their, or to, to make that level of income. Um, so based on this analysis, uh, we were comfortable concluding that the mortgage interest deduction is, is inequitable um, by, by race and ethnicity. I want to hit a little bit of statute. I'm not going to dive too far into this. Um, but Oregon's income tax statutes have some goals at the top. And uh, I, I just pulled out a couple of them here. Um, income taxes in Oregon are supposed to be equitable and fair, the system is. They're supposed to be evaluated based on guiding principles, including ability to pay, even distribution, and efficiency. And they're explicitly not supposed to be regressive. Um, so based on the work that we did before, we, we concluded that, or, that the mortgage interest deduction specifically doesn't meet the goals of Oregon's income tax policies. We didn't want to just stick to data in our work, um, so we did go out and meet with um, seven uh, counselors and staff from seven different home ownership centers in Oregon. I don't know if some of you may be out here that we spoke to, um, so if you are, I appreciate your time. Uh, so we wanted to learn how the mortgage interest deduction helps their low to moderate income home buyer clients. And so we asked them what the primary barriers to home ownership were that their clients faced. And then we also asked them if the mortgage interest deduction was an effective tool for those barriers. And um, the primary barriers they told us were limited funds for down payments, high prices in the current market, and credit issues were the primary ones we heard. And all but one of the seven centers we talked to told us that the mortgage interest deduction was not an effective tool for their clients. It did not promote home ownership for them. Um, and I pulled this quote out. Um, it really stuck with me when we were doing this work. One of them at the end just wanted to tell us, they, uh, she said, I can't think of a single client that the mortgage interest deduction ever made a difference for. Um, oh, I didn't skip the slide. I'm sorry. Now we'll go one more. <laughs> Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about why the mortgage interest deduction is regressive, and it's, des it's its design that leads to that. As an itemized deduction, um, there's really three key reasons why higher income taxpayers are more likely to benefit from it. Um, they're more likely to have itemized deductions to, to count. Um, they're also more likely to own more expensive homes, so they have larger mortgage balances and larger interest payments. And then finally, they pay a higher marginal tax rate, so each dollar of uh, income they don't pay taxes on is a, is, is, is a larger tax benefit than for people farther down that, that income ladder. Um, so we looked at this for Oregon specifically, that's what this table shows, is what really the mortgage interest deduction benefit was at each, um, at each income quintile. Uh, 
for each hundred dollars of mortgage interest they deducted. Um, and there's a there's a, a clear increase. It's more valuable um, uh, as your income increases. Um, a table like this at the federal level would be even more would show an even more regressive distribution because there's a wider range in income tax um, uh, marginal income tax rates at the federal level, but um, it it follows in Oregon as well. Maybe there we go. Um, so we were thinking about we looked at the causes for this, um, and one thing we we kept getting stuck to was that the mortgage interest deduction doesn't have a purpose in statute, either at the federal level or the state level. There's no key purpose for why it's there. Um, and we went clear back to the original income tax laws at the federal level and the original income tax laws in Oregon, and didn't find any didn't find any clear purpose. Um, it used to be it used to be that all personal interest was it was tax deductible, um, but um, uh, all of those have fallen off except the mortgage interest deduction. Um, and in DOR's response to our audit, they told us that the mortgage interest deduction is not unique in this lack of a purpose um, for tax expenditures. All right, so um, I'm gonna hit through that last objective real quick. Um, basically, we found that the mortgage interest deduction isn't receiving any substantive state level evaluation. Um, it is included in the biennial tax expenditure report as required by statute, but there's no actual evaluation of whether it meets its purpose or not. And um, the tax expenditure report says that its purpose is to promote home ownership, but there's no clear reason for that, or there's no clear evidence that that's true. Um, Oregon does have a best practice policy for, um, tax, for tax credits that they sunset every six years and need to be affirmatively um, passed by the legislature again. And, um, but since the mortgage interest deduction isn't a tax credit, it's not included in that review either. Um, so our conclusions based on this is that this lack of transparency limits the visibility and accountability for the mortgage interest deductions regressive outcomes. All right, so based on all of that, um, we came up with a couple of recommendations, and this is a little atypical for us. Uh, we usually make our recommendations directly to an agency, but we, went, um, we made these recommendations to the legislature. Um, so I'm gonna read this just to keep myself safe here. Um, so, uh, barring legislative action, the mortgage interest deduction as currently designed will continue to produce inequitable results. Uh, to inform potential changes for a more equitable policy, a regular evaluation is warranted. Um, so to help guide these future evaluations and inform policymakers and the public, we recommend that the legislature identify a clear purpose for the mortgage, mortgage interest deduction and uh, determine if any changes in its design are needed to meet that purpose. And then we also wanted them to identify a state agency that will be responsible for regularly evaluating it going forward to ensure that it meets that purpose. Um, so that's, that's my overview of this report and I will, uh, I will hand it off to Juan Carlos and I think we'll have time for questions at the end. Well, hi, everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying your lunch. Uh, this is the first time I've spoken in public in about three years, as I haven't been in a room this big in this whole time. So I'm glad that this first time out of the box in three years uh, that we get to talk about the mortgage interest deduction, because it's such an important issue of economic justice and housing justice. As John's presentation makes clear, and as the Secretary of State's audit makes absolutely clear, the mortgage interest deduction is a disaster when it comes to tax policy and housing policy. At a time of a horrendous, prolonged housing crisis, our state's biggest housing subsidy is doing nothing to solve the problem. In fact, it's making things worse. Uh, the mortgage interest deduction uh, exacerbates wealth inequality. We know that home ownership is the cornerstone of wealth for most families, and it also worsens wealth inequality by race. If you ask just about any economist or analyst who's looked at the mortgage interest deduction, and it doesn't matter what their ideology is, what their political affiliation is, they will tell you that the mortgage interest deduction makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense to give the biggest housing subsidy to those who are most housing secure, and to give nothing to those who cannot afford a single home. So why is it that the mortgage interest deduction is still around? That's the question that I want to focus on. And there's no single answer to that question, uh, but I'm going to highlight what I think are the key factors for why this terrible public policy is still in the books. The first reason, I think, is because many people wrongly assume that they benefit from the mortgage interest deduction. 
only a third of people, a third of Oregonians actually claim the mortgage interest deduction in their taxes. That means that two thirds of people do not. This of course includes renters who are at the epicenter of the housing crisis, but it also includes many homeowners, those who are having the hardest time paying their mortgage. So, so part of the reason for why the mortgage interest deduction is simply lack of information, and part of that has to do with the comp complexity of the tax code and how we claim deductions that people are not sure if they benefit from it or not. The second reason why I think the mortgage interest deduction is still around is because many well-off homeowners, the primary beneficiaries of this housing subsidy, are unwilling to recognize or simply don't care about the fact that they benefit from the biggest housing subsidy. I've been talking about the mortgage interest deduction for a number of years now and engaged in debates online and in person. And it's amazing how when I describe the mortgage interest deduction, when I call it a subsidy, some people bristle at that, at the notion. They say, don't call it a subsidy, when that's exactly what it is. We're lowering the cost of owning a home with public dollars. So part of the reason is just this unwillingness of those who are most housing secure to recognize their privilege and how that, you know, just grabbing on to that housing subsidy, you know, limits the opportunity for other folks who really need the help. And the third reason, and probably the most important reason why the, house, why the mortgage interest deduction is still around, is because there is a big and powerful lobby out there that is blocking reform, that it's doing everything it can to kill common sense reform of the mortgage interest deduction. And that lobby is the Oregon Association of Realtors. And I want to be clear that I am not talking about individual realtors because some of the strongest voices out there talking about the need to reform the mortgage interest deduction are in fact realtors. They have met with lawmakers. They have gone and testified and given very powerful testimony in favor of common sense reform of the mortgage interest deduction. I'm talking about the Oregon Association of Realtors. One of the biggest lobbies out there, they spend the, one of the groups that spends the most money every year. And they not only lobby a lot, they also are not shy about misleading the public. Uh, let me show you uh, one mailer that they've been sending out, that they sent out last year. And if we can show this slide, please. So this is a mailer that, they, that the Oregon Association of Realtors sent out last year. And let me give a little bit of context. The reform that has been on the table for a number of legislative sessions now would do a, couple, a few things. First, it would begin to phase out the mortgage interest deduction to taxpayers with taxable income of $200,000 a year. And it would completely phase out the deduction for those making a quarter million dollars or more. So we're talking about the richest 5% of taxpayers. That's who would be affected by this. We would also, we would also eliminate it for uh, the ability to deduct on second homes, in other words, vacation homes. And it would take the revenue savings between 200 and 300 million dollars per budget period, quite a chunk of money uh, when it comes to what Oregon spends on housing. And it would put this money, and this is what the bill says, it would put this money in a special fund that could only be used for uh, emergency housing services and home ownership programs. That's what the bill says. And the Oregon Association of Realtors knows this full well, and yet they send out mailers uh, that basically lie to people, and they blanketed people's homes with these mailers. I'm not gonna go through every single lie that's in here, but let me just point out the one that says, some legislators in Salem want to raise taxes by eliminating the state mortgage interest deduction. That no one has proposed doing that. We're talking about phasing it out for the richest 5% of Oregonians. So let me conclude by saying that we are facing a very severe and prolonged housing crisis. And our biggest, state's biggest housing subsidy is housing program is doing nothing to solve the problem. In fact, it is making, making it worse and it is exacerbating wealth inequality. So, if there are folks in this room who are realtors, who are members of the Oregon Association of Realtors, I would urge you to contact the organization that lobbies on your behalf, that speaks on your behalf, and urge them to change their ways, to 
uh, stop blocking common sense reform of the mortgage interest deduction. Thank you, and I'm going to pass it on to Jenny. Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Just a moment. Um, these are really important words, and I know that some folks in the audience are very interested and are having a hard time hearing. So if you could calm down your conversations around the table for just a few more minutes. <laughs> respect to our panelists, respect to your colleagues, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, I promise the mortgage interest deduction is so outrageous. You will want to talk a bunch together uh, about how you can change this after, after you, we finish up this presentation. Um, so hi again, I'm Jenny Lee. I'm uh, the deputy director at the Coalition of Communities of Color. And I'm really excited to be here today just to talk about what I think is the textbook example of racism in our tax policy and in our housing policy. So you heard some from our uh, colleagues at the Secretary of State about, or you saw on the slides, about the disparities in home ownership rates. And I think everyone who is here is very familiar with the state of home ownership in Oregon, and especially some of the most glaring disparities where home ownership rates of uh, white households are about twice that of black, native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander households, as well as significant disparities for other communities of color in Oregon. So just level setting, when we look at who this benefits, that this is blatantly something that does not provide benefit to all communities equally. And similarly, I know the history of exclusion from the state of Oregon, land theft, redlining, and lack of uh, previous home ownership opportunities to build wealth have resulted in these disparities. But even um, more than that, it's important to note, as you saw specifically for this policy, that who is a, has these um, mortgages, is um, there's a significant disparity. And so drawing from uh, my CCC colleagues' uh, report on the racial wealth gap, which you should totally check out, it's on our website, um, white ho households um, nationally are actually 2.5 to 5.7 times more likely to be eligible and approved for loans over $500,000 than black and Latinx households. So even when you're looking at folks in similar situations, a discrimination and in structural inequities into uh, mortgage lending policies is baked into that. And similarly, looking at housing assistance and who has um, need for living in regulated affordable housing or receiving housing vouchers, that's essentially a lottery. You know how long folks end up on wait lists, how desperate folks are to receive housing assistance, and then at the same time, we have a guaranteed subsidy for wealthy folks who qualify for the mortgage interest deduction. And thinking about what that says about our values and tax policy and housing policy, it is truly outrageous that we've taken, we've made that commitment to uh, wealthy households and are leaving so many folks who are in urgent need to um, have a safe and stable place to call home. So the benefit here, we have an opportunity for change, even modest reforms that are um, common sense um, have the ability to raise millions, um, hundreds of millions of dollars to redirect into programs that are actually effective for addressing inequality in our home ownership rates and in opportunities to build wealth. So these, um, I think for the last however many years, this has been a live issue at the legislature. I've been, uh, I can't remember how many years I've gone to testify about this policy and the issues with it. Um, but over the past couple years, um, we've had legislation, Senate Bill 852, House Bill uh, 2578, that did make progress receiving hearings and moving through the uh, Senate and House housing committees. So significant progress um, from what we've seen in the past where some the conversation never really got off the ground. And so the legislation would have made um, these common sense changes uh, to phase out the deduction for the richest Oregonians and eliminate the deduction for owners of vacation homes. So just as you heard Juan Carlos share, these are practical policies that are not going to make put anyone in a situation where they are struggling. So those would have been uh, more than $100 million each budget period to invest in confronting the statewide housing crisis. Um, 
And so these resources could be redirected to any number of options. Um, I'm sure that all of you, ever, all the work that all of you are doing every single day um, could then instead be supported uh, for things like individual development accounts, um, emergency rent assistance, helping uh, make emergency payments for people who are at risk of losing their homes, housing children experiencing homelessness. The list goes on and on, but there's a whole menu of options uh, that are out there to use these resources um, and, to, and redirect them toward actually addressing Oregon's housing crisis. So um, going into the 2023 session, I think what's really exciting is that the Joint Task Force um, Addressing Racial Disparities in Home Ownership just voted this month to uh, recommend a package of policy proposals to the legislature to help close the gap in home ownership rates. So there's a direction to continue um, resourcing and permanently resource the IDA program so that it's responsive to the evolving funding needs. Um, and then also look at the changes to the mortgage, or make changes to the mortgage interest deduction that would enable um, us to adopt policies uh, to close this gap with the resources that we're already essentially uh, just giving away to, again, subsidize uh, higher income homeowners. So also uh, really encouraged to hear the equity of orientation in the Secretary of State's audits and the recommendations to really get out there and say, why do we have this policy? And if we're going to have an inequitable policy, let's just be honest about it then, that it's a subsidy for folks who can already afford to purchase homes and to purchase um, homes that are more ex on the expensive, um, more costly than what um, folks can afford at the starter or um, working families level. So. One other important piece of legislation I wanted to mention, um, this is the second year, but we're very optimistic about the chances of it moving that CCC has been working on, is the ability to collect racial and ethnic data on income tax forms. So as you heard, uh, we don't have all of the granular information that we would want to um, understand the racial equity implications of our tax policy, but we do have a bill that will be a big step forward in helping to address that. So. Um, just summing up, I really hope that you will consider, but as an individual, that your organization, your board, um, will take a position uh, to stand against this inequitable policy and advocate for uh, um, the um, racially just housing justice investments into the folks who need it most. So um, Housing Oregon has been uh, working to organize a coalition meeting coming up after the election to mobilize supporters. You can definitely let Brian and his colleagues know if you would like to join. Um, so we'll, I think you have signups available and then certainly uh, we, um, I know Housing Oregon will be working hard to um, outreach to all of you to, to make sure that you're informed about this issue and know the ways that you can be, um, get involved so that we can end this inequitable tax policy and and um, give more um, urgent assistance to the folks who need it the most. So thank you. Wow, thank you. So, so the purpose here was to lay out the data and the issue. We heard from Juan Carlos about you know, the battle lines that are already being developed uh, out there about change and narrative and communication and then Jenny updated us about possible legislative action moving forward. Um, I, are we signing up if anybody is interested, Brian? We didn't get that far with signups. Yeah. Um, we'll take questions from the audience, and then if we've got time, we've got a couple of planted questions as well. But are there any questions about the data, the messaging uh, that's going on out there already, um, the legislative action uh, that Jenny has outlined? Teresa, yeah. Is there a mic or? Yeah. Hi, thank you, panelists. Teresa Diebel with Occam Advisors. I'm wondering if there are any lessons from other states who have been able to make these common sense modifications and what we can learn about where those important inflection points have been, narrative change or, or whatever they are? Yeah, um, 
Uh, so we did look into what into what some other states have done, um, and there are some limits. There are often uh, overall limits on itemized deductions. They're not usually focused specifically on the mortgage interest deduction. Um, so they'll often like phase out as income increases, as your income increases over a certain threshold. They'll sort of be like a dollar for dollar reduction in how much you can um, deduct. Uh, so so um, so those are in place. Um, and then I believe that there are some um, states that have that have limited um, the second home. I think Wisconsin. I think your second home has to at least be in Wisconsin. I think I think that's the way that they've. I think that's the way they limited it in Wisconsin. Uh, it's in the report. Uh, if I missed that a little bit, I'm sorry. If I'm a little wrong on those. Um, but 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 we did look and sort of present those other options. We didn't we didn't recommend any of those specifically. But we did want to show that there is a. a, a universe, maybe a slightly small universe, but there is a universe of, of, of options for reining these in a bit. Um, and we were comfortable with focusing on the, some of the ones that limited itemized deductions generally, because um, some of these issues of regressivity may exist within the um, broader universe of itemized deductions as well. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to add one thing to that to clarify about what the auditor's office does, because some of you may have asked, well, why don't you present some of those as recommendations as opposed to this more broad recommendation of, you know, legislature just go figure out what this thing is and measure it. And the reason is, is we don't develop policy as auditors. If we develop policy, and believe me, me and John would love to take a crack at policy, but we can't audit that policy. So if you're wondering about that, that's how we keep our independence and our objectivity is we aren't going to tell. There's a lot of good ideas out there, but just if you're wondering why we are more generic is we, that's why our elected officials are elected to figure out what we're supposed to do, and then we can help them measure that. So thank you for that great question. Follow up as far as your communications, advocacy work, legislative work around the country. Are what else is going on in terms of mortgage interest deduction? Well, to sort of follow up on that answer, we know that there are many states out there that don't have a mortgage interest deduction and that have higher home ownership rates than in Oregon, and that's something that's very important to point out because ultimately the mortgage interest deduction is just apart from it being inequitable, it's just an effective public policy in terms of advancing home ownership. And in fact, we saw in 2017 when the, uh, uh, I can't re remember the official name of it, but the Trump tax cuts, massive tax cuts that were enacted in 2017, um, our organization is not a fan of it. Uh, it most, of the, most of the tax cuts were geared towards corporations and the most well-off. One, one of the good things in that plan, though, was raising the standard deduction that effectively eliminated the mortgage interest deduction for the vast majority of federal tax filers. Fairly few people now claim the mortgage interest deduction. You have to be really well off to claim it. And you know what? The world did not fall. I mean, housing, housing uh, home purchases were still uh, going through. I mean, it did not affect anything. So I think in terms of narrative, I think it, it helps as, a, as a, a very prominent example that if we were to reform the mortgage interest deduction, uh, it, it would in no way affect Home ownership here. Hi, my name is Vera Lewis. I'm with Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives, PCRI. And my question is, thank you, panelists. My question is around the data. Um, I, the slide said 31% um, black homeowners and 60 some percent white. Well, we're in a state where there's less than 6% black people. So is that data controlled or how do you come up? Yeah, thank you. First of all, congratulations PCRI on celebrating 30 years. Um, I could have been more, more clear describing what that table showed. Uh, each of those were the percentage of, of people within those groups who were home, who, who owned their own home. So it was 31% of uh, black or African American or Oregonians own their own homes and 64% of white Oregonians own their own homes. So that was the difference on that one. And you're the second person who's, who's had that question. I've presented this a couple of other times, so I need to, to tighten that slide up a little bit because there must be some miscommunication in there. <laughs> so I'll clean that up going forward, thank you. I would like to 
ask, especially Alejandro okay. and Jenny, how would this policy benefit renters who are probably most of the BIPOC people who we, we are talking about, you know? Um, so I guess that's my question. How would it benefit renters? Thank you. Juan Carlos. I'll, I'll let Jenny go first. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the concept of, um, behind, because it will first answer, right now it absolutely does not benefit renters because by definition you have to be able to own a home and hold a mortgage as well. So there's a lot of homeowners also to keep in mind. Any folks who have paid off their home, you know, they're not benefiting from the mortgage interest deduction either. And I know for um, organizations like PCRI, who's one of our members, you know, you know how much um, we also, how many folks are struggling to afford um, to stay in their home. So whether it's maintaining them, affording their taxes. So um, there's a chunk of homeowners that it doesn't help. But to your point to renters, um, th the way that we could help renters is by changing the policy so that that folks are able to receive some kind of um, housing assistance. And so in particular from the um, task force, the priority has been to invest in, um, in the in IDAs, individual development accounts, which are match savings program to help folks um, you know, who are first time home buyers to save for a home. Um, other proposals that have come up have been around um, things like helping um, families with children, who are often renters, uh, to um, uh, to stabilize and get housing assistance to remain in their homes. So it's just one of uh, many critical pieces of housing policy that we need to change. And so certainly things like tenant protections also are essential. But this is an opportunity with our um, how we're spending our state resources, making our tax expenditures that we can divert them to support folks in uh, building wealth, accessing home ownership, and staying housed. So like, thank you. And let me just add uh, to Jenny's great answer that the bill that we have put forward in years past would, as I mentioned before, raise somewhere between 200 and $300 million per budget period. So uh, even if you took half of that to help renters in some way, that would, that would go a long way. So, uh, you know, rent assistance, uh, whatever, whatever makes most sense. So there's, of all that billion dollars that goes to the mortgage interest deduction, there's just uh, better ways to spend that money. Thank you, thank you for the question. Brian, I saw, also saw a hand up, up this way next, or after, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for all of your work. Um, this is just a practical question and so much as you've already discussed on this topic is about narrative and about education. And um, as leaders in kind of the coalition to try and get mortgage interest deduction reform through, I'm wondering um, if we have a centralized resource, accessible information that we should be pushing folks to. You know, of course, we're the choir here. Um, but for the folks who aren't in the choir, uh, where should we be, be pushing them to be able to access the right information uh, and, and kind of the narrative that we're trying to push here? Great question. Uh, shameless plug, but uh, if you go to OCPP.org, we have a lot of information. Uh, we've written commentaries, uh, op-eds, reports uh, that have a lot, not just data, but a lot of narrative as well. We also did a podcast recently featuring uh, Kip, uh, as well as Secretary Fagan. Uh, so there are resources. I, I would say that the campaign hasn't had a standalone uh, web page, so unfortunately, uh, where we could just direct people to that. So uh, perhaps that is something for coalition partners to, to think about. And the audit is online, right? The audit itself is online. Yeah. Hi, uh, so my name's Tess, and I'm, I'm relatively new to this issue, so it sounds like there's a lot of, of expertise in the room. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of really excited to learn more. And I also work with homeowners who are working very hard to hang on to the homes that they have. And obviously, a lot of the challenges that they have are interest rates, taxes, 
an inability to maintain the homes that they're in um, because of their finances, et cetera. And I was listening to you guys, and again, I'm learning about this issue. Um, I'm a homeowner. I'm definitely not in the top 1%, and I can promise you I'm not rich, and I also take advantage of the mortgage interest deduction. And I've used that money in the past to, to do upkeeps to my house. Um, I've used it to get some rooms painted where some paint was peeling. I also used it one year to take my kids on vacation uh, that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to take them on. So I guess like while I'm looking at the data and I understand the data, most of the people that I know that own a home that are middle class um, or lower, everybody that I talk to does use this and they use this little bit of money to benefit in ways that basically help them keep their homes healthy or their lifestyles healthy. So it's not that I'm disagreeing with your data because obviously it's super solid and I'm excited to hear. Um, but I'm just curious if you've actually polled the public, um, people who do own homes and that you know make $100,000 or less a year and asked them, are you using this benefit and how do you use it? Um, because this little bit amount of money that I know adds up to millions across the state, it does make a difference for individual homeowners. And so I'm just curious, when I'm out there talking to homeowners every day who are doing everything they, they s I think we all, it, we're, I think, I, think I, I will have owned my home, own, the bank owns my home, but I think that I would have been living in my home that the bank owns for 20 years before the interest is actually lower than the principal. It, so like right now, $700 a month goes to interest. And like, do you guys see what I'm saying? So I, I'm just, as a, you know, when I hear $100,000, I don't think top 1%. Yeah. So I think about a lot of, you know, or between 50 and six. So that's just my question is, have you polled individuals to, to ask you know, what they think about this. I'll, I'll take the first step. I guess probably everyone on the panel might want to take a bite on that one. Great question. Uh, one thing is we don't say it doesn't have benefit, right? And so it does have benefit, and that's what we showed. It has an inequitable benefit. So what, what we were trying to lay out basically is not dismissing it. I took the exemption. I'm a state employee. I'm not rich either. Uh, and so that wasn't our point. Our point is, you know, within the context of the audit, was our criteria. We don't make up the criteria. The criteria is the law. So w there is debate. There isn't a lot of good data exactly how this helps. There's a lot of anecdotal data and a lot of conversation. And hundreds of dollars here, and of course, make a difference to everyone's life. Um, but what we were is, what is the public purpose? We have a housing crisis here. There's a billion dollar subsidy that is not being reviewed. And as we dug, most laws have a purpose. And this one does not. There's a fallacy that is for home ownership, but it's not explicitly put anywhere in federal or state law. And so to your good point, we're not trying to, we're not trying to do, we're just trying to clarify state public policy out of the auditor's office, but we're, we, we inherently acknowledge the benefit through showing who gets the benefits and who does not. We didn't pull anyone, do it, a, do it a statistical valid survey of the public is a pretty hard in, endeavor. But John, I'm not sure I don't want to put you on the spot. I, I think for Juan Carlos, you were saying two thirds of people who are eligible don't even claim it. I, is that accurate or? Yeah, let me pass it over. Yeah, if you, if you look at the tax data, two thirds of tax filers, full year tax filers do not claim the mortgage interest deduction. And a, no, it's because they don't qualify. It's because they, it does not make tax sense for them to do so, to, to claim it. So even a huge chunk of homeowners do not claim it. If you look at, uh, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, uh, John may have them, but if you look at the average benefit, uh, it, it increases as you go up the income ladder. So for lower income homeowners, you're getting peanuts. I mean, it, it's really, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that you can actually paint the room with the money that you get. Perhaps you can't paint a room, but you cannot do any, you cannot really keep your, it, it's not something that will help you keep your home. Uh, even for, for the highest income folks who get a, a tax benefit, it's money like, you know, I don't know, I can't remember, there was like a thousand, whatever it was, so here we are. Yeah, so the average uh, MID benefit for the top 1% is 1138 $1,100. 
So that's nice to have. You can maybe go on a nice trip or something, but it's not something that's going to help you keep your home. That's just fun money for the most well-off. So this is bad public policy. There's just no way to sugarcoat it as far as I'm concerned. It's not doing... It's not helping low-income homeowners. Most of them are probably not even claiming it. Those who are getting the benefit are getting minimal amount of money. Uh, we could do, be doing a lot better as a state, taking those resources and helping those who truly need help. And then, um, oh. I'd add, um, in li like we mentioned, the conversations that are on the table, we're really talking about folks, I think, and I, I don't want to assume anybody's income, but, but the top 5%, that's a 200,000? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to peek. So, so, um, and and yeah, that is a, a policy decision. And we can look. You can look at the chart. Um, if you take a look at the audit, and you can see are the folks who who should be receiving the benefit of our tax policy. And in this case, it goes up increasingly the more folks earn. And so that's why the policy has been calibrated to uh, really look at the folks who are um, able to stay in their homes. And also, um, to, to your point, it speaks really that targeted um, interventions to support folks in housing is really critical. So we advocate for things like uh, resources for low-income homeowners to uh, cover expenses and have healthy homes. So absolutely, and the legislature has done some work around that to increase resources there. Um, so my organization has advocated for that, um, but knowing uh, you know how we're spending our resources. There is additional money that is um, be staying in folks with higher, you know, wealthy folks' pockets, and we could get even more resources to meet critical housing needs. So similarly, and that includes things like making sure folks can afford to um, ha keep um, stay in their homes um, and make sure that they are able to afford critical repairs. Um, so that's um, really looking at folks are in different situations. You know, not everybody owning a home acknowledges it's not the same. Um, uh, but that's, again, why we've tried to make this a really, um, these policies are focused. Uh, if I can clarify to emphasize what Jenny just said uh, for the previous question, it would start to phase out at households making 200, individuals or households making $200,000 and wouldn't completely be phased out till 250000 And I'll say again what she said, it's only the top 5% of uh, income or those at the top 5% of wealth in the state that, that would be affected by this. Right. Thank you, Brian. Um, before we let you go, um, I just want to say thank you to Housing Oregon Board and the conference planners for bringing this audit and this conversation forward as Housing Oregon continues to focus on racial equity. Um, we feel like this was a tremendous opportunity and a wonderful conversation to continue to give life to and to have this conversation. So um, with that, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to our panelists, please. And if, if you have more questions, please reach out to any of us directly. Um, and we also know how to get in touch with one another. So um, thank you. Have a great afternoon.